Hello and welcome to the first part of lecture 22. In this video, we're going to discuss the key terms and key equations that re relate to relativistic momentum and energy, as well as relative velocity in special relativity. In the second uh, video that is related to this lecture 22, we're going to go over some examples. Okay. Now this lecture and the two videos related to it cover sections 25 or 26.5 and 26.7 from survey 11th edition. All right, well, let's get to it. So our objectives include learning how the velocity of an object depends on the frame of reference from which it is observed. All right. We also want to learn how the theory of relativity modifies the relationship between velocity and momentum. That's going to be relativistic momentum. And finally, we want to practice how to solve problems involving work and kinetic energy for particles moving at relativistic speeds, which is going to allow us to define something called relativistic kinetic energy. OK. All right. Well, let's get into our key terms. All right, so our first key term is total energy. Now, total energy is the energy of a particle or object that includes its kinetic energy and its rest energy. Okay, so it's the total. Now, notice that I didn't mention a potential. That's because we're, we're to assume that we have zero gravitational or electromagnetic potential energy. It's not necessary, right? It's, it would just be an addition to the problem. It wouldn't change the definition at all. So for clarity, we're, we're going to assume this is a particle that is somewhere where there's no significant, gra significant gravitational field or electro, electric or magnetic field. Okay, so fine for our definitions. If we wanted to add those types of fields, we certainly could. Okay, now what the heck is rest energy though, right? Because the total energy is the sum of kinetic energy, which, we, which we've seen before. Then what is rest energy? Well, rest energy is the energy possessed by a particle or object when it has no kinetic energy. Okay, so again, notice I'm not mentioning gravitational or electromagnetic potential energy. That's because we're making the same assumption. Okay, so the important thing here then is it's the name rest energy is exactly what it sounds like. It's the energy of mass at rest. Okay, now where does that energy come from? Well, rest, rest energy is really created by the strong and weak nuclear forces. This is at the forefront of modern physics. It's not something that is exactly understood. It's not something that's exactly agreed upon. There are various theories that include, you know, trying to understand what's happening at that um, subatomic level. Um, and the, you know, in terms of in terms of quarks, in terms of what are the carrier particles. Um, the reason I say it's still a developing theory is because we don't we don't have a carrier of our carrier particle for mass itself, um, only for the forces. And so um, that that's really kind of where the theory ends. But a lot of it, a lot of the that that energy associated with mass can be thought of as the the strong and weak nuclear forces. I won't get into them right now. Um, we will talk about them briefly at the very end of the semester, the last lecture or so. Um, but essentially, the strong nuclear force is the force that holds the nucleus together, and the weak nuclear force is the is the force that prevents neutrons from becoming protons. And that's a real rough explanation. But that's kind of the the forces that are going on um, at the scale of the nucleus and smaller. Okay. So that's it. So that's what rest energy is. It's, it's really just the energy of mass itself. Okay. So that allows us to think of something called the principle of conservation of mass and energy. So this is an extension of the conservation of energy that includes mass converting to energy and energy converting to mass. Okay. Um, so mass converting to energy could happen um, with the very well known nuclear reactions of fission and fusion. In fission, breaking a large nucleus apart into two smaller nuclei that have less mass, um, or in the case of fusion, fusing together two very light nuclei into one larger nucleus that also has less mass. And then where did that mass go? That mass became kinetic energy and also became photons. So some, some, of, the, some of the mass became kinetic energy of the products, um, or, and that's where the energy went, and the, or the mass becoming energy. Other, other of that mass actually became light. So, which is sort of a pure massless form of energy, well, quite exactly a pure massless form of energy. All right, um, energy converting to mass. Many, many of my students say, "Oh, well, we can't go that way, right?" We can obviously, you know, people know E equals mc squared, and they've heard about nuclear bombs or nuclear power plants, or maybe, maybe even the sun. Um, but you know, certainly you can't turn mass in, or you can't turn light into mass, right? We can't just make mass, but no, we can. We absolutely can. Um, there's some a few common reactions. Um, it kind of depends how energetic your photons are, so how how you know what um, frequency light we're talking about. But if it's high high enough frequency light, then you can turn a pair of photons into a, a electron positron pair. So essentially, an electron and an anti-electron, which is also known as a positron. 
Um, and there's reasons why it has to be that those pairs, it has to have conservation of charge. These are ideas that we will talk about um, in, we have you know, chapters dedicated to this under the quantum mechanics um, kind of umbrella. Um, but you know, certainly it's possible and you could create um, more massive particles um, such as um, other, um, you know, other particles besides electrons and positrons just depending on the frequency of the light. Okay, so that's it for our key terms. Let's get into our key formulas. Okay, so the first key formula doesn't have anything to do with total energy, rest energy, or the principle, principle of conservation of mass and energy. It's really kind of the other, other topic that's being covered in this section, and that's, a, that's the idea of relative velocity. Okay, so relative velocity is something we've seen before. Um, in fact, I kind of, when I first started the, um, the introduction on relativity, that's where we, we first came, we came up with that, right? We, we said, oh, you know, there's relative velocity, and then it turns out that, you know, light doesn't obey relative velocity. That was kind of the big impetus, the, the starting point for the argument that led to length contraction and time dilation, okay? So now we're kind of circling back around to readdress relative velocity because in a sense, we kind of left something hanging. We said that light doesn't obey relative velocity. In other words, light always moves at the same speed in every single reference frame, okay? That was the big deal. And, if you, and I'm not gonna repeat myself, you know, at the cost of going into another 20 minute explanation about what, what that is. Instead, you know, refer back to any of the, pre, the four previous videos from lecture 21, in particular the first two, okay? So, um, or I'd say the first and the third. Um, but anyway, so the loose end is that, that what about plain old relative velocity? You know, do we still have, you know, VAB equals VAC plus VCB? Does that still apply? Is it only light that doesn't, doesn't work? Well, it kind of can't still apply because that was assuming that length and time were absolutes, but we showed that they weren't in exchange for getting a new absolute, the true absolute of the speed of light, okay? So then what does relative velocity look like with our new rules, right? With the new reality that we've come to accept? Well, it looks like this, okay? So what is that? Well, let me explain the variables and then it should, it should be, it should seem to follow in the same way that length contraction and time dilation naturally followed from the postulates of Einstein, okay? So essentially what I'm saying is that these equations pertain to this figure up here. Okay, so I included the figure because I think it's a valuable one. All right, so let's label our, our, um, our variables here. Okay, so what is Vx prime? Okay, so this is the velocity relative to S prime. Okay, so I'm gonna write that down. Now, do you all remember what S prime is? So, velocity relative to S prime. Remember, S prime, I showed it right up here, is the moving reference frame. Okay, that's, that's the notation that I'm using, that S prime always represents the moving reference frame. Okay, so this would be the velocity of some object relative to the moving reference frame. Okay, so what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to the velocity in the non-moving reference frame. So that's the velocity in the rest reference frame. So velocity in rest reference frame, okay? So that would be in reference frame S, this one right here, the one that is not moving, okay? Minus U, well, remember what U is? U is the velocity of S prime. It's the velocity of the moving reference frame. So velocity of moving reference frame. So if we just looked at that, that would essentially would bring us back around to Galilean relativity, okay? So that, because it would basically tell us that, okay, so I wanted to know how fast something was going. Um, you know, let's say like I've got, you know, some, uh, a car and the car is gonna shoot a bullet, right? These are two quick things, right? And so this would be the velocity of the bullet relative to the car. This would be the velocity of the car relative to the ground. I'm sorry, yeah, relative to the ground. And then this would be minus the velocity of the car um, relative to the ground, okay? So then if I wanted the velocity of the bullet relative to the ground, it'd be the sum of the two, the velocity of the bullet relative to the car plus the velocity of the car relative to the bullet. Okay, so 
that totally makes sense. It's exactly what we would expect. Or if we wanted just the velocity relative to the car, we have to subtract out the velocity of the car. So that way we take the velocity relative to the ground minus the velocity of the car, and then we get the velocity of the bullet relative to the car. Total, total logic there. That's classical physics. So if, if we just looked at the numerator, that's what we get, the classical physics. But Einstein's special theory of relativity gives us the denominator. So what's going on in the denominator? Well, it's all the same terms. We've got u, the velocity of the reference frame, of the moving reference frame. We've got vx, that's the velocity of the object relative to the rest reference frame. And then we've got the speed of light. Okay, I'll just go ahead and label that. So it's not, you know, you don't look at it and you're like, wait, what's c again? But it's the speed of light, so that's always what we use C for. Because of course, right? Speed of light is C. Yeah. It actually seems kind of normal, but it's an odd choice of letters. Maybe. Okay, so if we look at this equation, there's, then we can make sure that at least we can justify its existence. I'm not going to derive it. The best way to derive it is with the, with the Lorentz um, factor, the Lorentz coefficient, gamma, and you can go through and you can kind of set up a coordinate system with, with all the kind of with length contraction and time dilation, and then you just go from there. You just kind of, it's, it, it takes a few lines, it's a, it's a bit of a tedious, um, but you know, good practice of algebra, okay? Tedious process, but good practice of algebra. So instead, I'm just gonna justify that it works. All right, so let's, let's, um, let's look at this first one, and then I'll explain why I have two versions of it. But this first one here, so let's think about what's happening when we're traveling um, very, very quickly, right? When we're traveling near the speed of light. So if we're traveling near the speed of light, if u is nearly the speed of light, then look what's gonna happen, right? So then we're going to have the, you know, we have a, a u close to c both times, okay? And then what does that mean about v? Well, if v is, and then v, this is v sub x, so, so not v prime sub x, it's v sub x, as velocity relative to the rest reference frame. If u is close to the speed of light, then, you know, what do we get for v sub x? Like, you know, how, how, fast, how fast will it, will it be? Well, it can't be much faster than the speed of light, right? And so that means that what we're gonna start getting is that u and v are both gonna be approximately c, and so then we're essentially gonna have c squared over c squared, which is one, we're gonna essentially have one minus one. So that means we're essentially dividing by zero, right? Well, that's not good. Well, that means, because that means we're starting to get an undefined velocity relative to the moving reference frame. So in other words, if, if I set it at C, then I'm not, I'm not gonna get a velocity that works here, right? It, it can't be that fast, and it certainly can't be faster, okay? And now let me look at the other one, the second version. Because here, it's, it's just, we've just moved our terms around, and now we've set it up to solve for the velocity relative to the rest reference frame. And this might be the more common one, because this would be the, the rocket shooting the, um, you know, shooting the, uh, or spaceship shooting a rocket, okay? So the spaceship shoots a rocket, then your spaceship is U, and then your rocket is Vx prime, and then how fast that rocket is moving relative to Earth would be Vx, because Earth's a rest reference frame of S. The rocket is S prime, moving at velocity U relative to Earth. So now let's think about what happens then. If we shoot the, the rocket very close to the speed of light, then we're going to have a Vx prime that's close to C, okay? Now, if the spaceship was also moving very close to the speed of light, then that means that U is also almost C. So then what we would get is we'd have C plus C up here, okay? So C plus C, because it, these are both almost moving at the speed of light. And then we'd be dividing by one plus approximately c squared over c squared, okay? So that's essentially just gonna give us two c divided by two, which will just give us c. So we see then what happens is that we never exceed the speed of light. This equation is set up in such a way based on the postulates of Einstein, the math that gave us the Lorentz coefficient, and then the following algebra, that's where, that's where this equation comes from, and it tells us that you can never go faster than the speed of light. You can't, you can't somehow circumvent the special theory of relativity. You can't circumvent the speed limit of the universe and say, oh, I'm gonna go almost the speed of light, so I'm not breaking it. Then I'm gonna shoot a rocket almost going the speed of light. But then together, if we're both going 0.9 the speed of light, then the rocket's gonna be going 1.8 times the speed of light. Woohoo! I broke physics. No, 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 no. Because the equation clearly shows you that that doesn't happen. You would just get back to C. Okay, it, the equation approaches C. Okay, all right, so we're gonna put that to use in some examples in the second video. But for now, let's get back to the equations that relate mass and energy.
Okay, so that's really going to kind of be the, the rest of this, um, this, this video and uh, also quite a few of the examples. All right, so next equation down the list is something called relativistic momentum, okay? Now, relativistic momentum is coming right out of basically, it, you could really, one way that it's sometimes derived, because you look here, is that, you know, I'm saying that P equals MV. This would be classical momentum right there, right? Momentum P, translational momentum, that is. We won't, we won't talk about relativistic angular momentum. But so we have relativistic translational momentum equal to MV. That, that's what classical physics, that's what Newton tells us. Okay? So we've used that quite a bit. So it should be a familiar formula. Now, the idea here is now I'm dividing by the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared, which is the same as multiplying by gamma. That's the Lorentz coefficient, okay? Lorentz coefficient. Okay, just as a reminder, gamma equals, and then I'll finish my thought about it. Sometimes, sometimes the way people will justify it, although we will um, shy away from that. 1 minus v squared over c squared, all in the, all the denominator inside, inside the root. Okay, so that's gamma. Now, this is the same gamma that shows up with time dilation and length contraction. Okay, so refer back to that, those, those videos in the, that lecture. So, why though? Why, why is momentum doing this? Why is momentum, um, you know, because essentially it's telling me that my momentum is going to get really, really big, right? Because what's happening, right? As v approaches c, my momentum is approaching infinity. Do you see that? All right? So take a look at that. I'm going to add that as a note in here. So if I have, so we'll say relativistic momentum, relativistic momentum, okay, as V approaches C, Momentum P approaches infinity, okay? So why is that? Well, because if we have this, if C squared over C squared, if V becomes C exactly, then I would have one minus one, and so then I'd be dividing by the square root of zero, and that's undefined, but what if, I was, what if V was slightly less than Z? Then I'd be dividing by the square root of a really small number, which would be an even smaller number. So in other words, my denominator would be tiny, tiny, tiny. And what happens when you divide by a very, very small number? You get a very large number. So it's telling us that, that with relativity, momentum doesn't just go up linearly, but starts to go up quite non-linearly, asymptotically you know, approaching infinity, right? So it never, it, it's, you can never, you, you can never reach the speed of light. So if you're, if you were looking, if you're looking, if you had a graph of momentum um, versus velocity, you would see it just go up, and it would have it would have a vertical asymptote at the speed of light on the horizontal axis of v. Okay. So that is telling us that you can never take something with mass to the speed of light, because if it takes an if if it requires or if that object with mass would have an infinite momentum when it reached the speed of light, then how could that ever happen? What amount of energy would it take to accelerate something until it reaches a velocity that gives it an infinite momentum? Well, that would require an infinite amount of energy, but I'll show that more in a more compelling way in just a second when I show you the energy equation. So, so we'll circle back to that. But my original point, which kind of got lost in the, lost in the way as I, as I was making other points, is that Sometimes the way that people derive relativistic momentum is they'll say that there's this term relativistic mass. And so they'll say that this, this term, let me try to circle it more clearly. So this term with the m times gamma, so just gamma m, is relativistic mass. So it's saying that objects effectively get more massive the faster they move, which is a good kind of rule of thumb because it explains a lot. But it's actually fundamentally misleading when we think about some things about the directionality of, of um, objects and the way their acceleration vector points relative to the force vector that accelerated them. And so that, that's, where, that's where relativism mass just simply gives you the wrong idea. It can be misleading. Um, so it's, it's, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of kind of pushback, um, and it's kind of become a more antiquated version of, of how to present this material. Okay? So I would say don't, don't find yourself really kind of maybe taking solace in the idea of relativistic mass and just move on, okay? So 
All right. In that train of thought, I'll just move on to the next term, which is relativistic kinetic energy. Okay, so over here, I, I label relativistic momentum. That's obviously referring to P, but I'm going to add a, a label to the next line, which is relativistic kinetic energy. So let's do that. So relativistic kinetic energy. Okay, and here I'm just going to give you the expression. Now, this this there's a there's a calculus derivation. It's really easy. Essentially, you can say that um, that you have the in the relationship between momentum and and velocity, and then the and the way you get to kinetic energy um, with work. Then you can um, and you basically use the work kinetic energy theorem, and you can then get um, relativistic kinetic energy. Okay, but I'm just going again just kind of going to hand it to you and show you this is the expression. Now. The thing about relativistic kinetic energy is because the way we got there, um, the way it's derived, it ends up having two terms, which is a little jarring because you might be like, well, that's darn right strange. Why does that have, to have two terms? You know what the, And it's, it's also the way that is, th there's other ways to express things, but this is kind of the, the best way to, to express relativistic kinetic energy. So again, let's justify why the equation works and kind of show its limits as V approaches C. Okay, so here's the whole expression for relativistic kinetic energy. It's mc, so mass times the speed of light, all over, you know, the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, which is essentially just, again, multiplying by gamma, and then minus mc squared, okay? So what's, what's the, why is that? So that's because we're subtracting the rest energy, okay? So then you can think of the kinetic energy as this, this term, which is, I guess, kinetic energy plus, and then minus the rest energy. So I'll just, explicitly label that this right here is rest energy. mc squared is rest energy. And a lot of people have seen that, you know, the famous E equals mc squared, which were, you're probably starting to get the hint that's only part of the picture. So then we have here, this is rest energy. Okay, so then when you, you know, realize that, oh, okay, well then I have a gamma, because that's what the one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, that's just gamma, and then, well, mc squared is just mc squared, so you can factor out the, the, the like term of mc. Oh, and I have the typo, I thought I'd fix that here. This should be mc squared, absolutely, it's not mc, it's mc squared, so please, please excuse that, it's a really, really egregious typo. Okay, so it should be mc squared. Okay, so you can factor out that like term of mc squared from both, both expressions, and there you go. You've got your relativistic kinetic energy, all right? So, what does this tell you again, right? How does this what does what is the kinetic energy approach as you know as v approaches c ah same thing okay so point out here as v approaches c relativistic kinetic energy k approaches infinity right cuz look at the, it's, it would be the same thing right this term here would grow infinitely large sure you'd be subtracting another term but another term that's independent of v so it wouldn't it would you know, it wouldn't matter after a while if you're subtracting it because it just become, you know, insubstantial compared to the sheer uncontrolled growing of the first term. And so that means that K does approach infinity. So then this is a really clear cut, clear cut way of saying that particles or objects with mass, okay, expressed by M, measured in kilograms, can never reach the speed of light because it would take an infinite amount of energy or work for them to do it, right? Because to achieve a kinetic energy that is infinite, it would take infinite work to do it. Well, you clearly can't apply an infinite amount of work on something because there's no such thing, okay? So then we have the quite important consequence that, so this tells us Particles or objects with mass can never reach the speed of light. We'll say speed C. It's simply impossible. They can reach 99.99% the speed of light, but they can never reach the speed of light, right? This is maybe perhaps most famously 
documented in a Nobel Prize was awarded to a team of physicists that found out that neutrinos, these very important particles that come from the sun, that they have to have mass because they were doing something that was time dependent, which meant that they didn't have infinite time dilation. And if they didn't have infinite time dilation, that means they couldn't have been traveling at the speed of light. And if they weren't traveling at the speed of light, then they had to have mass. So they kind of worked backwards from the idea that things of mass can't travel at the speed of light. And they took the kind of the, the supplemental proof that says, well, if objects that have mass can't travel at the speed of light, then anything that doesn't travel at the speed of light must have mass, which perhaps we're not proving here, but it turns out it is a directly proven the proof. The proof goes both ways. Okay. So what about the, what the heck is this, this next equation I have here at the bottom of this page? You know this this little this odd one here. Well, this is actually nothing to do with physics so much as it is a tool that physicists physicists use, and it, it comes from mathematics. Okay, and so this right here is gamma. All I've done is I've just rewritten gamma in, without the square root notation, but instead with the kind of the, just expressing the exponent using the the rules of exponentials, the laws of exponentials. Because anytime you have a square root, it's one half, and anytime you have a a, a um, an exponent in the denominator, it's a negative. So then having one over the square root is the same as negative one half, okay? Review your laws of exponents, that is all confusing. I know I refer to that occasionally, but this would be a good opportunity to make sure that you know that absolutely, okay? So it turns out that anytime you have an expression like this, you can use something called the binomial approximation. Now, mathematicians probably wouldn't call it that. They'd probably call it the first term of the binomial expansion, and they might even call it the first term of the Taylor expansion. Um, but Physicists tend to call it the binomial approximation because we just kind of use it all the time. We just need a, a quick way to refer to it. Um, so that's what this is right here. This little approximately equal symbol would be due to something called the binomial approximation. So we'll say because of the binomial approximation. Approximation. Okay, so where does it come from? You know, what are the rules of it? Well, this is the only time we're going to use it. But essentially, what you can then say is that you can you can take you can pull the exponent down and multiply it. So it ends up being you would have one plus and then the whatever your exponent is times the second term. And in this case, the second term is negative v squared over c squared. So if I'm multiplying the exponent of negative one half, the negative times the negative becomes a positive, and so that that becomes my my approximation. Okay, um, now that's a really useful approximation because it allows us to talk about how to go from relativistic kinetic energy to non-relativistic kinetic energy. So I have, a, I have a particular example where I'm going to use it, but it, it can come up quite a bit. Um, it can come up for other, other times you're even using relativity and you just need to maybe find out a small effect of relativity that would normally show up as zero. The binomial approximation can show you that it in fact is not zero. Not zero. So it's kind of a window into something that would other, otherwise get lost. Okay, so I got a couple more for you. Okay, so these are the last, last two equations and the end of this video. So what's going on here? Okay, well, this is total energy. It's the first term. Okay, so, and that's always what we've used. We always use E for total energy. Um, we've also used it for electric field, but hopefully the context is clear. So total energy. And the total energy is kinetic energy plus rest energy. Okay, well, remember kinetic energy was gamma minus one times mc squared, and rest energy is just mc squared, so that means that total energy ends up just being gamma mc squared. I know it's kind of weird, right? Because it's like, because the kinetic energy had a negative rest energy, and then we're adding rest energy, so we're just effectively canceling it out. So when we get total energy, we, we see that total energy is actually just the first term of the two terms that represented kinetic energy. And again, not deriving these is, is particularly unnerving, but it's, it's saying that the total energy is going to be, well, I mean, what's, what's the best way to think about this? Because it's, it's going to be larger, right? It's always just going to be, it's going to be, it's just this first term, okay? Because we didn't, we don't have to counteract the effect of rest energy, okay? So hopefully, you know, that you can kind of quickly see where that comes from, all right? So that's just total energy. Now, this next one, though, isn't so obvious, right? Now, I want to show where it comes from. So I'm going to show where, how we can combine, and I'll label these, equations one and two in order to get this equation three. So we'll call this one two, 
and we'll call this equation three, and then equation one is going to be our relativistic momentum. So one, okay? So I'm gonna show over here. So say note, equations one, so relativistic momentum plus total energy gives us expression three. Okay, and all it is, all expression three is, is just total energy squared. But it turns out that by squaring it, we can really clearly show something that otherwise would really get kind of lost in the algebra and the math. Okay, so I'm gonna actually show this one. So let's walk through it. Okay, so we'll have equation run, one, so relativistic momentum. So M, V, let me just write it like gamma. So gamma, M, V, again, remember, right? That was what we had over here. Or relativistic momentum, okay, and then plus gamma mc squared, okay. So then I want to show that that's going to give me give me this expression, okay. Well, how would I get there? How would I how would I show that? Okay, so I'm gonna I'll rewrite it, okay. And again, let's see that I yep. So um, yes, okay. So then I want to square both sides, okay? So, because I'm trying, let me, um, okay. So because ultimately I do want to get E squared, and so that's gonna be this term here. So if I, because I know it's not so much that they're exactly, let's see. Yeah. Let me erase this. So and let me, I'll, you'll see why in a second. So let me just work this out. Okay, so we got gamma mv um, plus gamma mc squared. Okay, so let's actually just square this side here, this side. So I'm going to do e um, squared is going to then be gamma squared mc squared squared. Okay. So that's, that looks good, okay? And then I want to rewrite the gamma expression, because if you look here, you know, that's, that's what we got so far. But then I want to, I want to deal with the, with gamma. So let's think, how do I want to do that? Um, because I need to show, because we have that P is M, or is gamma mv. Okay, and we also have, so I think I wanna use this side of it. So here, let's go back to this. So I'm gonna do, write it like this. So I'll have k squared plus mc squared squared. Then I'll do, I'll like kind of expand that out. Okay, so then I'm gonna have k to the fourth plus m c squared squared and now the now the middle terms so two k squared m c squared okay so then I want to show that the k to the fourth plus the two k squared m c squared that that's that's just going to become p c squared okay so let's see if we can work that out so I'll pull the middle term to the front because we want that to Stick around. Okay, I'll move this up here. And I'm going to change my wording a bit up here because I still want to say so. One was, so we'll say combining one and two gives us three. And I may not show every step here, I just want to at least set us up for a justification. So then we'll get to here, and I'm going to have my k, so I'm gonna, let's go ahead and fact, factor out a k squared. So that will give me k squared plus 2mc squared, okay? And so then I want to show, basically I want to show that this expression here is going to be just pc squared, pc quant, quant, quantity squared. And I'm going to skip to it because I don't want to you know, go through every single set, step. Um, so let me do that. So we'll just say, you know, I'm sort of skipping ahead, but at the end, at least you can kind of see what I was getting at, that then this just becomes that, okay? So 
it come, there's, there's, there's no secret missing formula. You can show algebraically that combining equations one and two, you get equation three. Okay. Now, the only thing I want to say about equation three is, um, is that what, um, what equation three tells us in particular, what it really, really clarifies is that it, it gives us a way of thinking about the momentum of light. Because it turns out that if we look at this equation, we can show then that when m is zero, then the momentum of light is just e squared over c squared. Okay, so let's show the big consequence because we kind of saw this, right? Now we, we kind of had a bit of a teaser early, early on, and I put this on the midterm. We talked about light and we mentioned that it was a photon. And we talked about solar sails, right? We kind of, there's a little kind of section of one of your chapters where we start touching on some of the things that now we're gonna get into a bit more. So I want us to further justify that so then we continue to see material in the next chapter, it will continue to make sense. Okay, so we'll say then that this equation shows that photons, those are particles of light, so photons with m equals zero kilograms, because they're massless, still have momentum. Have p, they still have momentum. Okay, not power, but lowercase p. And it's specifically, what would, they, what would that look like? Well, that would tell us that the momentum of a photon so P of a photon would be, well, let's think about it. I, you know, I have, it would just be, because this, this term would be gone, right? Because M equals zero means that the first term is gone. So then I have E squared equals P, PC squared, take the square root of both sides. Then I'm just gonna have that, I just have E divided by C squared. Well, what's the energy of light? It's HF, right? We already said the energy of individual photon, photons is this thing called Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. So you know how higher frequency light has higher energy. So it ends up just being h f over c squared. That's the momentum of a photon, which we kind of used when we talked about the conservation of energy, the amount of energy that is, in, that is pushed onto a solar sail. And then we use the concept of intensity and power um, in order to justify the, the acceleration or the force exerted on that sail. But here we can actually think about it as individual photons exerting momentum, because we know, thanks to the ideas of relativity and rest energy, that photons still have momentum. And I mean, this, this is taking kind of the, the idea that those two simple postulates, physics has to be universal, including electromagnetism, and, and, the, and that nothing can be faster than the speed of light, that those, those two simple postulates, you know, I said that the, kind of there was a whole bunch of consequences that came from them, and I, I made a big deal about time dilation and length contraction, but now we're seeing things that we wouldn't think of at all. The fact that, in fact, rest energy, the rest energy, E equals mc, comes from special relativity. It's, it's not a, its own theory. It comes directly out of the math that follows from those postulates. And even the confirmation that massless particles like photons have momentum is also a consequence of that, of, of just those simple postulates. It is just remarkable, awe-inspiring stuff, okay?